Please! Please, I can't breathe! Please, man! Uh -huh. I can't breathe! Oh, my God! Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He stopped calling his mama now. Mama, mama, mama. And that's when he stopped talking. I'm through. He's not responsive right now. He's not responsive right now, bro. You know, our our country is hurting. Our world is hurting. It's not a process that's happening, but it's happened. Portland has replaced black people with Black Lives Matter signs. Black people in Oregon were not allowed to be in here and they had a certain amount of time to get out or they would get slashes. So like knowing why there's not a lot of black people in Oregon, there's a reason for that. Just going out wearing Black Lives t-shirts and protesting is all great and dandy, but at the end of the day, there's still a lot of needs that black people are not receiving right now. Lionel. Mary, Jai, and Anthony are educators at Woodlawn Elementary School, the place we spent the entire 2019-2020 school year telling stories and documenting life. And it's very amazing that you all decided to, you know, follow us this year because this is a year that uh, our children will be talking about in history classes all around, you know, in the future about the impacts and unfortunately we're not even sure of all the ramifications of this and how it's going to impact us in years to come. I'm KGW investigative reporter Kristen Severance. We went into this project with no idea what the stories would be. This was Woodlawn's story. We were just here to tell it. And from that first day on, the obvious, clear thread between almost all the episodes was race in education. Sometimes it's not going to sit here and get them to understand the things they know if we're just sitting here being nice. And especially for our children of color, I feel like we don't have any time to waste. First grade, I don't think you'll ever find two black teachers in first grade in the state of Oregon. I think that's like a a unicorn. That's kind of every single day of my life, is, is the, the lens that somebody sees me as is, is negative first and that will harm them first. And while the rest of the world is now demanding racial equality, the teachers at Woodlawn have been talking about this and pushing for this their whole lives. Malcolm X talked about this idea of, you know, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, that's not progress. If you pull the knife all the way out, that's not progress. The progress comes from healing the wound that was inflicted. And at this point, to a large degree, they're not even acknowledging that the knife is there. Before we head back to continue this project in the fall, we wanted to talk with these educators about the racial reckoning happening now. From conversations about Black Lives Matter, the protests happening in Portland, and how they'll address all of it with their students. This is Inside Woodlawn, no time to waste. Lionel, so tell me, I mean, last time we talked, it was end of the year, episode 10. How are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm doing okay. I've been enjoying my vacation taking time to spend time with my family and just really getting out and trying to have a little decompression time, so. I'm doing well, despite the exhaustion of what's happening in the world around us. But still doesn't feel like that school year was ever really over. Just taking it, as I said, taking morning walks and try not to watch the news too much because it just really, you know, it just puts me in a, a mood that, you know, puts you in a dark place sometimes because it's a lot of negativity in the world. Um, and what, what, what bothers you about what you see on the news? Um, what bothers me mostly is just the debate about, you know, how black lives are not being looked at as, you know, a real organization. Um, they're being looked at as, you know, kind of a, a disruptive group. And, 
you know, we're still not getting the, you know, I think the equality or the support that we need from, you know, the bigger officials, the, the president in particular, our officials, even within our schools, I think they're not supporting us fully. And why do you think that? Why do you feel that way? Um, I feel like for in particular, I'm t um, from the eyes of Portland Teachers Program. I like, um, I'm looking from my lens as Portland Teachers Program because I feel one of the best programs in the state um, ended this year. I know we talked about that early in the year, but our program ended, which I feel now we need teachers of color in our school, and we kind of just went to the wayside. The Portland Teachers Program, or PTP, was created to get teachers of color into schools. Describe PTP for me, Lionel, in your own words. Uh, one word, it would be family. All of the Woodlawn educators in this room, plus kindergarten teacher Aldolfo Garza and fifth grade teacher Adrian Howard went through PTP. The program paid the tuition for students of color to study teaching at Portland Community College and get their masters at Portland State University. They would then get jobs in Portland or Beaverton schools. But after more than 30 years and hundreds of graduates, Portland State University said it could no longer offer free tuition to students because of budget cuts. The program is now done. After the PTP episode, there was a lot of talk about saving the program, but that never happened. As far as the conversation around Portland Teachers Program, exactly. I feel like there's a lot of double talk or there's a lot of people that say we need these things. But for me, proof is in the pudding. What are we doing to keep programs like Portland Teachers Program running? What are we doing to ensure that there are a diverse teaching force and really supporting all students? I'm not saying that white teachers can't support students of color, but I'm saying that it also is important for children to see people like them in the classrooms and to be examples as well. With everything going on in society, it's like that uh, another silencer um, to people of color. I think it's something that we're saying that it's so important to have teachers of color. Um, you know, there's all these legislative or district mandates that they want to hire people of color, have principals of color, and then we had something in our own community that was a, a driver for that, and it's, it's gone. Also gone, the neighborhood that many black families used to call home. The teachers and families aren't watching the neighborhood gentrify, it's happened. According to Woodlawn's principal, half the families can no longer afford to live in the once predominantly black neighborhood. So they live where they can afford, like Gresham or East Portland, and drive to Woodlawn to attend. Teachers do too. First grade teacher Anthony Lowry grew up near Woodlawn, but lives in Vancouver. It's like walking through a graveyard. It's like seeing tombstones. It's like things that used to be there. Um, houses, people used to know, community center places, restaurants that you used to grow up, you know, you grew up with. Nothing is there anymore. Not one thing, hardly. I am a firm believer that Portland is a city that replaces black people with Black Lives Matter signs. It is so true in the neighborhoods that are being gentrified. The idea behind the phrase Portland is a city that replaces black people with Black Lives Matter signs is that our neighborhoods are gentrified. Black and brown families that used to be in every house in this community are now primarily all white families. And that is largely in part due to gentrification. Families are priced out of their homes, generational homes. They're priced out and they move farther away into communities that they can afford. It's not so much the idea of just people being pushed out or priced out. I, I, I think about Alberta, Mississippi, you know, and a lot of people, I've heard conversations around the idea that, you know, well, white people are actually helping the community because they're bringing value to the community. They're bringing businesses. You don't think African-Americans would have wanted to do that on their own? The thing that we have to understand is it's not just a matter of us being pushed out of our houses. It's the opportunities that we weren't afforded. But why couldn't it have been people of color owning some of these shops? Um, you know, and, the, and that's the history of of Portland, you know, loans being, you know, redlining, loans being put out. A lot of people have their houses 
um, because of systematic racism. Um, so, you know, it's they, a lot of people didn't have a hand in that, but as people of color, those are the things we think about when we're kind of driving through the graveyard of old houses and friends. Families who are financially able to pay twice as much sometimes what uh, than what those houses sold for are moving in and their way, I believe, of um, respecting the community is putting those Black Lives Matter signs in their yard. Black Lives Matter can be seen all over Woodlawn, in hallways, on clothing, in lesson plans. Lionel Clegg talks about it with his first graders. I think it's just, again, the, the fact that we're having a larger conversation around Black Lives Matter and all of these things is a start. The fact that they're putting these on, you know, in Washington, D.C., they created the street. They're done it in front of Trump Tower. Uh, last we had a conversation, I think it was during Black History Month, you know, I was told by you that people were upset at the fact that I have shirts like this, you know, and my conversation around it then was the fact that, again, it's never been a question that all lives matter. We all know that. But the people that created this group actually wanted to put awareness to the fact that black lives also matter. Um, Luke 15 in the Bible talks about how Jesus had, I think it was 99 sheep and one sheep was lost. He left the rest of his sheep to go for that one. It's not that he didn't care for those other sheep, but that one that was lost is the one that he's worried about at this point. And that's what our world needs to start considering and thinking about. It's not so much that we're trying to put someone on a hierarchy or a pedestal, but we're trying to ensure that everyone is kept after and looked after properly and equally. I mean, that was February, February. Right. We, it was controversial that you had a Black Lives Matter shirt on. Right. And now look at the people wearing the Black Lives Matter shirts, where, you know, holding the signs. Do you feel satisfaction from that? I say it's a small victory. I mean, ultimate victory is when everything can be equitable and we don't have to have a conversation around the idea of do Black Lives Matter or do all lives matter or anything to that effect. It's really when, again, that's a non-issue is when there's the total victory. So I'm happy for the progress, but we have a long, long ways to go from that. And until society begins to change in the way kids are being raised in their homes to think differently and to really be taught to believe and practice that everyone is equal, change won't happen because these behaviors then become generational. I grew up in a home with my mom and my aunt, who are both all American white women, and my siblings and cousins, who are all from different countries and different states, and we are all people of color. Black, I'm Indian, Filipino cousins. My sister's from Haiti. We're from all over. I was in eighth grade maybe eighth grade, when I told my mom, when she says she doesn't see color, that she doesn't see me. And the conversation I had with my mom was that if you don't see color, you don't see when I walk into a store and my bags get checked for stealing. You don't see those lived experiences. You don't see my brother, who is a black male, while opening his locker in high school and seeing a noose hung in it. If you, if you don't see color, you don't see the fact that I get angry when Band-Aids don't match my skin tone. When you don't see color, you don't see these experiences that are taken for granted by so many people of your skin tone because it's not something you ever have to go through. All of these teachers are glad we're talking about black lives, but talk only goes so far. I think it's a great step um, in the right direction. I think it's opened a lot of people's eyes but I feel it's just a small step. You know, I feel that there's still work to be done in the, in the structures that behold us, you know, housing, schooling, jobs, economics, you know, all those areas, I still think we have a lot, I mean, a lot, a lot of growth to make. Painting Black Lives Matter on a street is great, but that's not the systematic change that needs to happen. Those little drawings and paintings give an image 
but they are not the change that needs to happen. Those acts are not retraining police officers not to kneel on someone's neck and understanding why that is wrong. I asked the educators about the marches and demonstrations happening around Portland. I think, again, it, it's small steps, but I'm very proud to see at least Portlanders uh, stepping up. And a lot of the marches that I see, I have to be honest, I see a lot of white people out there. I know that we're outnumbered anyway when it comes to people of color versus white people in Portland. But at the end of the day, I'm very proud to see the steps that they're taking. And I know for a fact that there are many people who probably six months prior to this would not have even considered themselves to be one to do something like this. I know there's been a lot of talk about what's happening when the sun goes down and what's happening during that. And, you know, I, I can't completely speak on that part because I haven't gone to any of the nightly ones. That's where it's easy for politicians to dilute the message of Black Lives Matters. The people that are, you know, most of the people I know that are protesting, that are truly about the cause, are in bed at 10 o'clock at night. So those people up, up, up late doing those type of things, I mean, I think they live for those things and it's just kind of a, a reason for them to protest or be rowdy or, you know, just cause problems because I know myself as a black man, I'm not going out throwing bottles of <laughs> the police. That's the last thing I want to do. So I can't see anybody that's truly a supporter of that cause even going that route. Woodlawn teachers marched together during an Educators for Black Lives rally. I don't feel like I can describe the love and feeling of togetherness that the teacher protest for Black Lives Matter brought to us. It was this gathering of thousands of people who love and care about the lives of kids, not only just in our community, but kids across the country, um, coming together and saying their lives matter, enough is enough, change, systematic change, needs to happen. Fourth grade teacher Jai Blair brought his 13 year old twin sons and six year old daughter to some of the protests. So race is a big conversation in our household. We talk about race a lot. Um, and so just for them to see it, to hear my little daughter chanting, you know, the names of people that have passed and and asking questions about, you know, why the police are shooting black people and seeing my son's leading chants during the protest, you know, for them to feel like they, they do have a voice and they can, they don't need to feel ashamed or silenced that, you know, when they come together in their community and, and you know, if there's something that is concerning that they can share that voice out um, has been great to see. Family community coordinator Mary Evans brought her kids to several rallies too. My three-year-old went to a protest and he was walking around. We made a Black Lives Matter shirt into a cape and he was walking around with his fist in his air, in the air, in his Superman outfit. But he sees it and he knows it. And my eight-year-old is educating the adults around him as to why his brown skin is just as important to the white skin of the people next to him. And it's important that we teach our kids that they can have these conversations. Portland Public Schools will start the year virtually, but could move to in-person classes or a hybrid model at some point during the year. What do you think it's going to be like and how do you feel about possibly going into class like two days a week? I'll be honest, I told you, I, I teach primary. I am very concerned about the idea of working at school right now. And that doesn't mean that I don't miss the kids and don't want to be with those kids. But as far as safety matters and precautions, I don't feel we've done enough, honestly. And I don't feel that we know enough in what to do to ensure safety for all, not just students, but teachers, parents alike. Because again, if one person contracts it at the school, then we easily can spread this to everyone and then they take it to their homes, which is something that really concerns me a lot. And learning wise, I don't even know what it's gonna look like. You know, now with all these protests and history and everything coming out, like as a fourth grade teacher, I'm supposed to teach Oregon history. And so like, you know, do I do that all virtually? Do I, you know, for a fourth grade student, is that right now completely appropriate? It's almost like teaching 
in fear almost. It's like you got to be very careful and you're thinking about, am I, do I have the right mask? And it's challenging, very challenging. The thing is, it for me as an elementary teacher, it really will change the scope of the way that I teach. I'm a hands-on teacher, I'm behind you, I'm kind of right there with you. I'm gonna be teaching from behind a shield almost for the most part, and I'm gonna be cautious about my distance between students. So it really concerns me that I won't be able to be the teacher that I normally am. And now as Woodlawn prepares to head back to school in the fall virtually, I asked how all of this will be talked about to their students. I mean, you look in my classroom, there's so many different shades of skin color and so many different types of households. And we, we know that America is built on race. And so if I have that all in my classroom, why not talk about it? Um, it is a, it, race is part of our society. And if we don't talk about it, then we're having this hidden Thing in the closet that doesn't need to be hidden. It, it's, it's everywhere that we see. I feel it's important because kids see what's going on. They see, they hear it, um, even in first grade and kindergarten, the early age, they, they formulate ideas. So I think talking about that, letting them speak their truths, letting them, and then kind of just guiding them in the right direction, I think is gonna be key. Um, the reason we have these problems, I believe, because race was never talked about. You know, race was just um, something you learn from your parents, you know, whatever your parents taught you. Or, you know, you may get out into the world and um, see some different things, but I feel that if you can plant that seed, especially at the primary level, that everybody's equal. Talk about, you know, give them examples of, you know, how things have been wrong to certain groups of people. I feel that, you know, that's still very important. I mean, a lot of this stuff that I know now, I didn't learn until college where I wish I had teachers like me that were talking about that um, at an earlier age. So that made me feel more comfortable by myself. My hope is, and I, I can't be so optimistic to think that we're gonna completely stamp out racism. But my thought is, is that people that have racist ideas should be too embarrassed to say it around anyone. That's my hope. and that eventually, you know, that will start to change, change the way things are happening.